Welcome to Two Girls and One Crime. Well, hello there. Hi. Welcome back to season two. Welcome to Two Girls, One Crime. Not Cup. <laughs> I'm Vita. I'm Jackie. And we're very grateful that you have come back. Hey, we've got a new topic. We have a new story. So this is an interesting story because this was told to me by a friend. Oh they told me this happened in their hometown when they were growing up. Oh my God. And um, it like made all the headlines. A 17 year old. Martin Tamcliff. Getting ready first day of high school, senior year. Oh no. He wakes up and his mom and dad are butchered. <gasps> what? And we're gonna go from there. So your friend grew up with this guy? Not grew up, but it literally happened in his hometown. Like a neighbor, a like person you would run into at the grocery Gross. store. Which is Free something store. I find is very interesting to think about because yeah. how many I mean maybe not serial killers so, but how many like just crazy people that you encounter and you don't that's, realize that's something that because I was editing one of our early episodes mm-hmm. for our Spotify and Apple podcast account and yeah I did ask the question I was like how many criminals do you think you like cross paths with in a casual setting every day and it, you don't know. I live in Hollywood, so I feel like I cross paths with a lot. lot of criminals every single day, and I smile at them, and, like, maybe they, like, you know, offer to buy me drugs, you know, like, who knows? <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. Mm-hmm. But they're, you know, I'm sure that I interact with a lot of criminals all the time, and I don't realize it. All right, so we're going to dive right into this very tragic-sounding story. Martin Tancliffe. The man punished for murdering his parents. Off to a good burp. Marty Tancliffe would wake up one morning to find his parents brutally murdered in their residential home on Long Island. What would ensue is a quick case against him. He would be convicted for two counts of murder and sentenced to 50 to life in prison. But did he really do it? Hmm. He's so cute. It's gonna be one of those cases. Mot. Oh, sorry. Ow. Ow. Abuse. I drink beforehand. <laughs> Martin Marty Tankliff was born August 29th, 1971, to his parents Arlene and Seymour Tankliff. I love the name Seymour. <laughs> you know Nobody's the- named Seymour anymore. No, but you know the the musical. Hmm. Suddenly Seymour. That one. You have food in your teeth. I know. That's I'm stalling. <laughs> um, what's it called? This one right here. The horror story. Horror. The. Rocky some horror. Little. Little. Shop of horse. Shop of horse. All right. Back to the story. On September 6, 1988, Seymour enjoyed a night of poker with friends at his home. After the game, everyone left. On the morning of September 7th, 1988, Marty woke up to his first day of his senior year in high school and found his parents stabbed and bludgeoned in their beds. His mother was already dead and his father severely beaten and unconscious. He quickly called 911 and began to give first aid to his father. When the police arrived, Marty's father, still alive, was taken to the hospital. I cannot imagine. That's a lot to deal with. When they questioned Marty, he immediately identified who he thought was the killer. His father's bagel shop business partner, Jerry Stuerman. He revealed that the partner owed his father half a million dollars. A few weeks earlier, He had recently violently threatened his parents by allegedly pulling Seymour across a counter and threatening to cut his throat. He was also the last guest to leave the Tancliffe home the night before. That's pretty graphic to be like... Pretty incriminating. I'm going to slit your throat. It's pretty incriminating. And from what I understand, the son was on trial. 
and not this incriminating business partner. Mm -hmm. This story is different from some of the other ones that we've read because it revolves around the case rather than Marty. Got it. Despite all of this, the Suffolk County authorities did not consider Jerry Sturman a suspect. Instead, the lead detective, James McCready, took Marty to the police station and began a hostile interrogation that would last for hours. Finally, the detective revealed that his father had awoken in the hospital and identified Marty as the killer. Marty was shocked, but he had been raised by his father to trust the police and his father was not a liar. That's confusing. Mm -hmm. So his dad woke up and said, my son did this. Correct. But he didn't hear his dad say it. The police told him mm. that that's what his dad said. And he didn't witness his dad waking up or saying it. Correct. So he just had to trust the police and be a good boy. Correct. So basically he's my dog, Dex. <laughs> he's just like a good boy. Good boy. B-O-I. B-O-I. What does that mean? Boy? Boy. So the detectives read Marty's rights and asked him to draft a confession. And Marty began to wonder if he could have blacked out and done the unspeakable. The detectives pressed Marty into stating a possible scenario of how it could have happened, although the narrative was inaccurate. Yeah, you scrape that plate, girl. You break that cartilage, whatever the fuck that is. I was trying to do it quietly. However, when he was asked to sign the confession, Marty would immediately recant it and refuse to sign it. You know what? Good for him. Yeah. It seems like they were forcing him into a narrative they needed so they could close the case. I'm like, fuck that shit. Still, he was charged with killing his mother and attempting to kill his father. When his father died from his injuries a few weeks later on October 6, 1988, that charge was changed to murder as well. A week after the attack, Jerry Stearman, Seymour's business partner, mysteriously disappeared and presumed to be dead. Oh. Meh. You think, like, okay, well, let's say he's the killer. What timing? I think he moved to the Bahamas. Hmm. With a bunch of money that he owed. Someplace sunny? Yeah. he and like pleasant. He owed them money, so he left. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's the 80s. Who knows what people got away with. A few months later, he reappeared. Okay, so he's not dead. It was discovered that in the weeks after the attack, as his business partner Seymour lay in a coma, he withdrew $15,000 from their joint business bank account, named his girlfriend the beneficiary of his life insurance policy, and then faked his own death. Sus. He shaved his beard, changed his hair, assumed an alias, and fled to California where he stayed in Big Sur for a while. He just didn't leave the country, but he did go somewhere sunny to get a tan. Mm -hmm. When Jerry was ultimately called to be a witness, he said that he fled out of fear that he would be blamed. He testified, I did not do this. On June 28, 1990, after a 13-week trial with no other suspects, Marty's confession was enough to get him convicted in October. And he was sentenced to 50 years to life. Eligible for parole in 2040. Sucks. <laughs> it does suck. It's not no even idea. 2040 yet. <laughs> you have no idea. It's like 2022, I think. I think I'm. <laughs> I think I'm like intoxicated already. Vita, where are you right now? What do you think you? What do you think is happening right now? I don't know. But can you read instead? <laughs> All right. An appeal was immediately filed and denied in the New York State Supreme Court. In 1993, by a vote of three to two, he was not well liked. Sucks. I feel so bad for him. The way he wrote it makes him sound so innocent. And I just mm. think, please. Okay. However, Marty would declare that he was innocent. And with the... Su I'm just going to wait for you to make all... Stop making those noises. Yeah. Clean that plate, girl. Lick it. Lick it. Lick it. It's so good. I know. I want to eat more. And with the support of over two dozen friends, family, and pro bono lawyers and investigators, they would work tirelessly to free Marty. In 2001, he convinced a retired New York City homicide detective and now private investigator, Jay Salpeter, 
to conduct a reinvestigation into the case. Mm -hmm. So 1990, he's convicted, put in jail. 2001, so it's 11 years later. Mm Mm-hmm. Got it. And, Damn. like, the murder happened in 88. So, 11 years of jail time changes. But 13 person. years since the murder. And he was probably detained. He was probably not out on bail, right? Ooh. I don't know. I have no idea. Okay, I want to eat this. Okay. Oh. Mmm. Mmm. All right. I'm going to focus. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I can focus. This is my favorite meal. I'm serious. Lamb shake with that salad and potatoes roasted mm-hmm. the way they were. I could die. Yay. It's like hard going out to restaurants sometimes because I like my food more. Mm-hmm. Um, Me too. Yeah, for sure. All right. J. Saul Pepper. Peter. I like Saul Pepper better. He did a reinvestigation. So... Jay would discover that the son of Seymour's bagel shop business owner, Todd Stuerman, sold cocaine out of the store in the early 80s, um, had actually been charged with the offense. According to a defense witness, cops were paid off not to interfere with the operation. Hmm. Defending Todd was Suffolk County District Attorney Thomas Spada. Suffolk. Suffolk. I mean, that's what I said. Suffolk. No, I did not say Suffolk. We'll replay the footage. And you're wrong. <laughs> Suffolk. I said Suffolk because it's in New York. Mm. I know okay. that county. Anyways, so Thomas Spada and his father Jerry had also been represented by another partner of Spada's. With this information, Marty's lawyers filed a motion for a new trial. As the news coverage of these new facts became public, many new witnesses came forward. After further investigation into Detective McCready, it was revealed that he was not on duty on the morning of the murder, nor did he live near the scene of the crime. Yet it was recorded that he arrived to the Tancliffe residence, dressed in a suit, less than 19 minutes after the page went out. What? Suspect. Page. Like the page. Like the, page like the, page. Hey, we've got a Okay, the page. page one eight page. seven at not like the internet page. No. Got it. In a court hearing. Of, I just had to remind everyone this Oh, you're such a Gen Z. Anna? What are you? I'm a millennial. I'm a millennial. God damn it. In a court hearing, a baking supplies wholesaler. <laughs> It's not good. She's I'm born in 1989. I'm born in 1989. Okay. She's just a hey. really big oh my gosh. Swift oh my fan. God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> so I went to go get some alcohol the other day at this cute market. And the guy was like, do you have your ID? And I was like, I actually don't have my ID. And he was like, oh, well, how old are you? Because you look 18. And I was like, sir, don't flatter me. Look at my tattoo. Who would get this tattooed on their arm? If they weren't 32 years old. Uh, Swifty. And so he wasn't a Taylor Swift fan, okay? 686 BC. You're older than I thought. I'm going to murder you in your sleep. (laughs) Next time on Two Girls, One Crime, it will be one girl, one crime. (laughs) And I will be convicted. (laughs) Or not. (laughs) Depending on how much body these dogs eat (laughs) can you imagine having dogs eat the person you murdered so that the evidence is gone Mm. that's a good idea what are you planning i don't know planning something Uh (laughs) uh-huh marrow did you just suck something out of the bone Mm. bone marrow what's in the middle marrow it's not a whole lot i don't want it nah Oh, wait. So, all right, back to the story. (laughs) In a court hearing, a baking supplies wholesaler would testify that he was 100% sure that he saw Detective McCready with Jerry at the bagel shop all through the 70s and the 80s. This contradicted Detective McCready's original statements as the lead investigator of the original trial that he never knew Jerry Stewerman. 
It was also discovered that in 1991, Detective McCready was arrested and tried for brutal assault of an individual and perjury in a previous murder case. In both cases, his lawyer was none other than Thomas Spoda, the DA. He was acquitted in a non-jury trial. Two years after Marty's conviction, Detective James McCready also opened up a bar with the husband of Marty's half-sister, who ended up receiving more of the trust than she would have had Marty not been convicted. Three people would come to testify that McCready was paid off by the Strumans or a man named Joseph Joey Guns Creedon to protect their drug business as well as their connection to the Tancliffe murders. Crazy. There were allegations that Jerry Struman had attempted to hire Joey Creedon to cut out Marty's tongue for 50000 bucks. Ugh. There were other rumors that Joey Creedon had then paid Detective McCready $100,000 to steer the case away from Jerry Sturman. Joseph's own son testified this under oath. So Jerry mm-hmm. at one point argued this because he said if he only got paid 50 but then he paid Detective McCready 100 that's stupid because he would have been out $50,000. And he owed the people that were murdered mm-hmm. half a million, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But what's the price of freedom, right? What's the cost of staying out of jail? While Jerry also publicly denied involvement, don't laugh, this is a murder trial. Or reread that, you make a straight face. While Jerry was publicly denied involvement in the murders, there were rumors that he would tell people privately. So what if I slit their throats? What are they going to do? Give me 50 years at my age? In the year following the death of the Tancliffs, a cabinet maker who did work at the bagel store, Neil Fisher, overheard Jerry threaten a man, screaming that he'd already killed two people, and it wouldn't matter if he killed another. Why would you say? Marty's, because he's got a narcissistic, egotistical yeah. fucking problem. It's like such a mom mentality. Like, mm. I've already killed two people. I can kill you. You two. know how scary I am? I've already killed people. Oh, yeah. I'm going to say that publicly because I just want everyone to know how big and fierce I am. That's what it sounded like, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Stormin. When they call me Jerry, they call me scary. <laughs> they call me scary, scary Jerry. Jerry. <laughs> Marty's private investigator, J. Salpeter, <laughs> uncovered even more evidence when he followed leads that were never followed up by the Suffolk County law enforcement. One lead was a sworn affidavit and passed polygraph by a woman named Carlene Kovacs, who had stated that she had a conversation with Joey Creedon, who told her that he and another man hid in the bushes before murdering the Tinkliffs. Afterward, they were so full of blood that they had to get rid of their clothes. That's a lot of blood. When he explored that lead, she tracked down another one of Joey's criminal associates, Glenn Harris, who was serving time for a parole violation. When questioned, Glenn gave a sworn statement claiming to be a getaway driver on the night of the murders. He told private investigator Jay Salpeter that he was hired by Jerry Sturman and drove Creedon and another man named Peter Kent the night of the murders. He insisted that he thought at the time that it was going to be a burglary, but the two didn't return until 20 minutes later, out of breath and full of blood. Glenn said that on their way out of the neighborhood, he saw Joey throw a metal pipe into a wooded area. A search of the site found a pipe fitting the description. When they questioned Peter Kent, who was also already currently serving time in prison because he a criminal, criminal, (laughs) he too broke down and immediately agreed to sit to assist the prosecution. It's nice when someone's already in jail because they'll just keep confessing. In 2004, Judge Stephen Braslow declined to grant Harris's immunity from prosecution, so he invoked his, fo- his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, and so his testimony was never presented. <laughs> Glenn 
Jonah Harris alleged that he had been beaten and intimidated in prison by the guards and on three other occasions by men sent by the DA to get him to change his story. Even without Glenn's testimony, however, the defense was able to assemble more than 20 witnesses to paint a picture that Jerry's German orchestrated the murders. 20 witnesses! That's a lot. 13 years later. So what does that say about the justice system? Oh, it's like that it improves. Fuck. It improves over time. Or it just was really like fucked up to begin with, but continue reading. We shall see. District Attorney Thomas Spoda faced scrutiny over corruption and public backlash for refusing to rescue himself from overseeing the Tankliff case. Given his previous position as the Stewerman's defense attorney and also having defended Detective McCready, there was significant conflict of interest. The DA would use every tactic at their disposal to refute these facts, including witness intimidation. And on St. Patrick's Day of 2006, the presiding judge ruled in the district attorney's favor and denied Marty's motion for a new trial. That fucking sucks. With 20 witnesses? Mm Mm-hmm. Didn't mean shit. But his legal team did not give up. They filed an appeal, and his story and the events of the case would be published and told to several high-profile outlets and shows, such as 48 Hours. Mm -hmm. As a result, thousands of outraged citizens, current and former prosecutors and organizations such as the Innocence Project would submit amicus briefs and sign a petition calling on the governor and attorney general to appoint a new prosecutor. Everyone agreed that Marty deserved a new trial. So if you think about it, social media is potentially what they tried to do. The source. Mm -hmm. Well, what I was going to say. Spreading the word. What I, no, you still haven't said it really either. The source of juries. Mm. You know, what's the point of a jury trial, right? It's like the public, mm. random selected people, of mm. course, they're vetted. Screened. Um, but it is the mass majority of the public opinion that helps determine a verdict. Mm. And when you turn to social media and you get a feel for how the public feels about a trial and how it's being portrayed Mm -hmm. in the early days, I think there was more authenticity to it. Whereas Mm -hmm. today, people know how to advertise and manipulate what kind of reaction they want. Right. Um, It's all curated. Yeah. But, like, back here in 2006, that's fucking genuine. Oh, are you guys waking up? Yeah, let's kick that out. Okay. Is it time to give them the bones? Yeah. Or that. (laughs) <laughs> is Dex going to want one? Yeah, of course he will. Oh. <laughs> All is right. this your tinted one? Yeah. Yeah. Just like slightly tinted lips. On December 21st, 2007, the Appellate Court revi- revisited the case and unanimously voted to vacate Marty's conviction and ordered a retrial. Mm, well, good for finally. 2007. Good for those woke-ass motherfuckers. After all the evidence and the witnesses. Almost 20 years later. Right? Isn't it crazy that a criminal who's so good at being a criminal can get innocent people convicted and jailed? Just because they're long. good at being a criminal. Yeah. Like, it also is shocking to me how long it takes for the system. innocence to reign. Yeah. You know, like you go to jail or you get uh, charged with something and it takes so long even for it to go to trial. So you're already in jail for that long. Mm-hmm. And then let's say you get found guilty after however long the trial itself takes. And then you have to wait for the sentencing hearing and then you appeal. And then going through the process again and again and again until maybe someone says, hey, maybe Uh, they're innocent. Maybe they didn't do this. No. A few days later, the New York State Investigation Commission revealed that they had been investigating the Suffolk County law enforcement for corruption for over a year. 
and were paying particularly close attention of the handling of the Tancliffe case. Mm -hmm. They kept it confidential so as not to interfere with Marty's appeal. One of the problems the Suffolk County Department were suspected of were coerced confessions. Sounds like what happened in 1990. Or 1988? Mm-hmm. 88. When they looked into the confession of Marty, they pointed out that the phone call by his father revealing to the police that his own son was the killer was a lie. Mm. Which was my suspicion. Mm-hmm. You have a good instinct about it. Marty's father never regained consciousness before dying a few weeks later. So that means they brought a dying man to a hospital who never woke up and never said it was my son. Right. And they... And they lied. Yeah. How fucking awful. Like, if you're going to frame a random person, why don't you frame an already convicted, like, criminal who's fucked up a bunch and just pin it on them? Someone who's already going to go to jail. Don't fucking frame the son who's, like... Yeah. Losing their mind that their parents were murdered? Yeah, that's pretty shitty. I mean, I can't imagine waking up to my parents being murdered and then someone being like, and you did it. And I'm like, what? I just I just happened to live here. <laughs> <laughs> There's no blood splatter on me. I don't have a weapon. You know what I mean? They did it's try. Like, I didn't. I didn't say it on here. Um, he, Marty had his father's blood on him, but that could be explained because he tried to like revive him. He tried to. Yeah, because his beyond. dad was alive. Yeah. I can imagine like if I saw someone I loved on the ground, I would be like, "Oh my god, yeah, are you okay? Yeah. Are you okay? Are you okay?" <laughs> okay, I tried to resist that, and then I was like, "Wait, my neck. I'll just go with it." <laughs> yes. I felt like I was being saved. Um, I enjoyed my baptism. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah! This Jew resisted her baptism, but it, but it was good after all. With the advent of DNA testing, we've learned that nearly a quarter of wrongful convictions are based on false confessions. How terrifying is that? That's a lot. It's terrible. Intelligent and educated people have difficulty accepting the possibility that someone would confess to a murder they didn't commit. Nine days after his convictions were overturned, Marty Tancliffe was released. Wait, nine days after convictions were overturned, Marty Tancliffe was released from prison on December 27th, 2007. Mm. Yes. On January 12th, 2008, Attorney General Andrew Cuomo... Famous, yeah. famous New York guy, was it's... named as special prosecutor in the case. On June 30th, his office would announce that they would not retry Marty, mm-hmm. citing that there was insufficient evidence to prove his guilt. A few weeks later, on July 22nd, 2008, a state Supreme Court justice dismissed all of the charges against Marty Tankliffe, exonerating him for the murder of his parents. Marty was finally a free man after serving 18 years for a crime he did not commit. Crazy. In March of 2009, Marty filed a federal civil lawsuit for the wrongful conviction against the state of New York and the Suffolk County Police Department and named several officers, including McCready. In January of 2014, so five years later, the state of New York settled for $3.375 million. In 2018, Suffolk County settled for $10 million. Wow. But he spent 18 years. No, I years. know, but still, like, we'll get At least to that. Something. I have a comment on that. Yeah. Marty would go on to study and graduate from Toro Law Center and pass the bar exam in 2014. He was sworn into practice law in New York and has been working as an attorney since February 2020. Good for him. Jerry Stewerman remains a free man and has never been considered a suspect in the Tancliffe murders. So it's almost an unsolved murder. No, it's not. 
Jerry did it. <laughs> wow. Does it make you like so angry about the system? It makes me angry. Yeah, I don't know. I, I Processing. Bit, I'll be an angry. Thing. Okay, so what I wanted to say immediately after reading was that he got around $14 million in settlement for his 18 years. Mm-hmm. A lot of wrongly convicted uh, criminals don't get any money mm, afterwards. That's true. They just say, uh, here's your clothes from 14 years yeah. ago. Yeah. A mm. lot of them don't get out of jail. That's true. A lot of people don't get a second chance at life. Yeah. And if they do, they're super fucked up, you know, and they mm-hmm. can't as- reassimilate back into society. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the fact that Marty got $14 million <sighs> and got to become a lawyer, mm. like, what a willpower. Like, what a... I, I, I almost want to, like, reach out to him and be like, are you accepting interviews? Like, can we question <laughs> you? You know, I feel like I've had dark days. But 18 years of prison, wrongly convicted of murder... For your parents. For your parents. Missing your parents. Not understanding why they were killed. Mm -hmm. Then having to bear the shame of the murder of them. You know, and like, Mm -hmm. it's already hard. Like, grief is already hard. But being blamed? And then for this kid to come out, ask for his worth. You know, sue. Fight for his right. And then become a lawyer? I'm just like, that's why I'm like, of all of the cases we've read, I'm like, this is the first time I'm like, I'd like to meet this person and just like, yeah, share space with him. And she's like, wow, like, you're incredible. Yeah. You know, you didn't give up. You could have. I think I'm actually going to (laughs) cry. I'm like really thinking about how hard life is as an adult. And I have never faced these kinds of obstacles and just... For him to get through what he went through and then come out on top and join the justice system. And I don't know what kind of law he practices. I'm sure mm-hmm. it's probably criminal defense. Yeah. Just to come out on top like confidently and fight for the, you know, and learn the law and fight for it. It's just like I, like you're, you would be in my book a superhuman because you're able to overcome things that usually are set back. That would Mm -hmm. not allow you to succeed. I'm really moved by this story, actually, because it is super devastating to me Mm -hmm. that he was wrongly convicted. And it was his persistence in like reaching out and finding the private investigator, the right people, the pro bono people. Because I mean, at that point in time, like he doesn't have the money, he doesn't have the resources. All he can say is like, "This is my story." And all I can do is like tell it to you and hope that you see it the same that you way listen that I do. and yeah. you have compassion for and it. And you found and people for who are gonna rally behind him. I think it's great how resourceful they were at the time, right? Because they were up against a system that was rigged, literally rigged, because it was proven to be corrupt. You know, it's just super yeah. devastating. And, and the fact that he could get convicted over no evidence. Yeah. There's no evidence. Yeah. You know? And you know, I, you know, this is a big case. Yeah. You know, and this big case put him away for the time that he did. But I also am aware that there's small cases out there of um, people of color. Mm-hmm. Who get, who get put away for life mm-hmm. for smaller offenses, and they don't have the audience that this guy had to even appeal to. We're starting to get an audience mm-hmm. because of mm-hmm. social justice warriors mm-hmm. on the internet, and that's what the internet is so powerful for. Is like mm-hmm. people that will fight for the for the wrongly convicted yeah. souls out there. Yeah. Um, so it's good. This is a white man in 1988. 1988 was was wrongly convicted of a murder, and nothing was done about it. Mm-mm. And my point that I was trying to make was that people of color are wrongly convicted uh, still today. So back in the in 88, if they were wrongly convicted, it was for life. 
and it could have been a drug it could have been a drug mm-hmm. charge like weed mm-hmm. it could have been a charge of just theft and they're like life in prison um and so there's just all these very unfair convictions that have been happening historically and i don't remember my point at all <laughs> But maybe through editing, we can piece all of that together. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think it was interesting how you mentioned uh, social media is like such a prevalent thing now, right? It is how now. we get the word out and everything. And with this particular case, he went through numerous said, appeals and everything. I yeah. said social media was the jury. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm saying like even in this particular case, pre-social media, everything, he didn't even get it. He like he got his appeal denied over and over and over again the final one being on 2006 in 2007 he got overturned only because his legal team had the like genius thought of being all right fine we'll just tell the story go everywhere. to the media go, go to, to the media, media. 48 yeah. hours yeah. dateline 2020 yeah. whatever it was that pressure was, on know, the yeah. public show to the give people judgment the narrative and that's that's yeah. that's what made me think and like petition the public and... is the jury yeah they and have to know look it's not relevant now but i'll just bring it up i said that because of the the trial between deaf and heard because deaf mm-hmm. won yeah trying to get one yeah because i think our cases mostly focus on the victims mm-hmm. whereas this case focused on is a victim the still. victim of wrong conviction, not mm-hmm. the victim of the murder. Right. So we didn't right. learn you like we didn't focus on what the life of the parents were. Like I don't know anything about the parents. I just know mm-hmm. they were murdered and then the son was wrongly convicted and yeah. that's what the case we structure, is. I structured this one different because yeah. I think the interesting aspect of this was seeing how the judicial system was so corrupt and it utterly failed him. Yeah, it did. Um, they didn't recuse themselves from the conflict of interest. They represented these bad guys. Allegedly, they were being paid off by all of them. Like, nothing happened, which is so disheartening Yeah, in the system. It's so disheartening. To morally say that they would rather put an innocent person away who was so traumatized and so damaged by the situation instead of i mean what was the alternate solution just saying like we don't know who did it it's an unsolved crime they'd rather seal it they would rather ruin someone's human yeah. experience on this earth that's just what to they say did. that they've yeah. solved a case you cannot go back in time he was a child when he was convicted he was in jail longer than he was alive and that's the point i'm trying to yeah. make it's like Like, good for him that he fought for himself afterwards and made a life for himself. He got money. He got a career. He's probably made a lot of peace. Not many people are like that. Well, anyways, I loved this episode, even though it made me tear up. It's a good good tear up, though, because it makes you really reconsider the judicial system and how fucked Fucked up and terrible that corrupt cops can be. Yeah. Right? Like, that's the thing that we need to really change, and that applies for today, too. Yes, it does. You know, we have our share of corrupt Black cops. fucking lives Clearly. matter. Stop no. Asian hate. Like, not all. And this is controversial. The Holocaust was real. But <laughs> I remember there was a period where it was like, all cops are bad, right? Remember that? ACAB? Yep. And... I don't agree with that. No, of course not. Know. Altruism is not a real no, thing. No, all but I think not, all none never always. When you like make you a movement, you have to make a statement. So Black Lives Matter is a statement, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what was the one you just said? All cops are bad. Right. That's also a statement. Hold on. So when you say black all black lives matter, I agree with that because even the worst black criminal their life still matters. But when you say all cops are bad, then that's very disheartening and goes against a good cop trying to do the right thing in a toxic environment. But I'm not saying that it should be taken literally. I'm saying it's a movement. But people will take it literally and that's the problem. I don't think they're supposed to be taken literally. I think everything is with a grain of salt, but it's a concept for a movement. So... Black Lives Matter or all cops are bad. No, of course there's good cops. And of course, like, some black people are serial killers that 
rape and pillage children. So I'm going to argue their lives don't fucking matter because they're monsters. You know, like there's an exception to every phrase out there. Um, I don't know. I don't remember at all why we're talking about this, but that was the point I was trying to make. There's an issue with cops because a lot of them are bad. And there's an issue with how the public treats black people. That's all I was trying to say. And I don't know why we were talking about it. I don't remember. It was really... We sagged into a subject. Yeah, I know. But I've I've had some vodka. And I keep thinking, like, oh, my glass is empty. When more are we going to refill it? But it's like, I don't need more. (laughs) (laughs) We just need to sign off at this point. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us again. If you haven't already, please subscribe. We have a Patreon also. Yeah. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, thank you so much. Please follow our page. Can we do that in a sexy voice at the mic? Yes, I'm just burping right now. So sexy. Hey, guys. No way. And if you're interested, you should subscribe to our page. <laughs> <laughs> Not on OnlyFans. <laughs> Yet. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> shh, shh, Jackie, shh. Hey guys, if you haven't already, please follow our Spotify or Apple podcast account. We'd love to gain more followers. We'd love it if you'd follow. <laughs> That's not what I did. <laughs> All right, bye guys. Okay, we had a great time. And good night. Thank you. Please follow and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs>